Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Earth Fest, which is a collaboration between Femina and Good Homes. Uh, we have a really interesting, very insightful talk planned today on a very uh, niche subject, which is outdoor lighting. And we've got some great, very young and um, enterprising uh, designers with us today. We have Harshita Jamtani, Somil Suchak, and um, Arjun Rathi. So before we start our conversation, I just you know want to do a quick round of introductions of all of them. We'll start with um, Harshita. Uh, Harshita Jamtani, she runs her um, eponymous design firm in Mumbai with a focus on um, lighting products. She has degrees in architecture and design. And she's a strong believer in creating products that are timeless and designed through uh, you know, green building methods. So a lot of her products are a mix of sustainable materials and very minimal, uh, elegant, clean lined designs. Uh, next up is Somil. He is the founder and the lead designer at um, Hatsu. He started his brand primarily to make affordable, minimal, and um, user-friendly mo uh, lights more accessible. And uh, more recently, he's also gained uh, you know, recognition for new furniture collections as well. He has a degree in mechanical engineering, but it was his interest in art and design that led him to setting up Hatsu. Uh, and last, we have Arjun Rathi. His focus has always been on uh, livening up living spaces through light. Uh, he looks at lighting as a very intricate craft and has created everything from single exclusive pieces to mass produced um, collections. He's also in the process of setting up a very, uh, a, a very interesting new uh, glass blowing studio in Mumbai, which we've just learned about. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, thank you all of us for joining us. We're so glad you could take the time out uh, to be here today. Uh, we want to start, uh, you know, where, because the subject is outdoor lighting, I want to start with uh, the space and the use of lighting in that space. So, of course, when you talk about outdoor areas, there's not a lot that needs to be done during the day. But as the day progresses, uh, you know, these are very, very large spaces that need to be lit. So if we're talking about residential spaces, there's open courtyards, there's patios, there's swimming pools. And commercial, you know, there are building complexes, there are entryways. So when, what are the factors that you as a designer would take into consideration when you are lighting uh, or sort of illuminating an outdoor space? Uh, Harshita, if you'd like to kick off. Um, sure. Um, I think um, we really love working around wall lights. So we, uh, in fact, that was one of our first products. Uh, when in, in fact it was a personal thing where I, I wanted to buy a wall light outdoor wall light for myself and I didn't actually get too many options in the market which were not made in China and were made in India in fact so um, that's how our first ever product even was made uh, on outdoor terrazzo wall light so uh, when we uh, actually try to um, light an outdoor space we try to mix it up uh, like how any interior space you have your task lights your accent your decorative your ambient lights uh, similarly, for outdoors also, we try to keep uh, a mix of all kinds. Uh, we are, we're currently working on clay bollard lights. We have um, these uh, varied string, which we call fairy lights. So we try to add as many things as possible, um, create layers of lighting rather than just having the typical up-down architectural fittings everywhere. So, okay. mix it up. yeah. So, what about you? What's your approach to outdoor lighting? So, I think... Uh... Outdoor lighting is pretty interesting because it's a play of light and material, you know, how the light falls on the material, where it is like, depending if you're using it in a courtyard, in a building or in a landscape. And um, the light, uh, when, when we look at indoor lighting, you know, we try, sometimes we make the light stand out, like, you know, how Arjun does it, that he wants the light to be the focus. But when you're looking at outdoor lighting, you need to, uh, you wanted to integrate with the environment. You need to, you wanted to blend in. You don't want it to like even show that this was a light, like, you know, during the day that it's a, uh, it's a light there. So I think that is very uh, important. Like, you know, may making it very subtle, uh, integrating it uh, and blending it in. Uh, this seeing how the light falls, what material is there. I mean, outdoor lighting can like material can be some, something natural material or some, concrete or metal and see how uh, like 
emotionally it can warm up the space and uh, i think yeah i think it uh, definitely like out- outdoor lighting uh, drastically improves the look and the feel um, feel of the space and yeah i think that that's what i think yeah i think you know with outdoor lighting um i think like somel and harshad have spoken about the product end as a lighting designer sort of the studio we tend to sort of like design spaces as well and when we are working on residential spaces it's very important to understand the client what type of ambience they want how they intend to use their outdoor space and that's why lighting plays a very important part in setting the ambience you know if you want a very cozy sort of a space for your uh, for your terraces and for your balconies so we sort of tend to use certain type of decorative lights mixed with dimmable sort of architectural lights and with outdoor lighting it's usually how well you can combine your decorative pieces along with the architectural lighting to sort of really create that ambience you know when you're working with commercial spaces generally with outdoor lighting longevity of the fittings and all become very important and that's where material plays a very important role as well but the same thing holds true because most of the commercial spaces which are outdoor lit are generally meant for congregation and setting the right ambience becomes uh, the role of a designer like you know how you mix the architectural technical lighting with the decoratives and uh, would you say that you know these factors that you mentioned of um, there being visual appeal as well as durability because you're looking at you know um, long lasting use uh, do you think that these uh, factors can be considered when you're talking about creating sustainable lighting lighting that lasts long that uses less energy and less resources so is that a is that a big aspect of sustainable lighting i think with sustainable lighting i mean there are multiple ways to sort of approach it you know uh, as sort of like designers uh, like you know on the panel we sort of design and manufacture in india so that itself is one aspect of sustainability where we are depending on local manufacturers to sort of like produce our work or working with local uh, sort of like you know factories not importing too many things and sort of you know so that itself creates a good sustainability sort of a start uh, with lighting uh, the main thing like to sort of also keep in mind is that uh, when you're making a decorative light it's all about longevity of the like material so there are very few sort of like you know organic sort of materials which we uh, which lot of designers have started exploring like ceramics porcelain which do very well in an outdoor setting but like many times you have to explore stainless steel or uh non corrosion resistant sort of metals because uh, when you design outdoor lighting for coastal regions in india for example the sea air is extremely corrosive you know and uh, and the like weathering effect is extremely high so it's important to sort of choose materials uh, based on that criteria okay uh, harshita i want to you know bring you over here because you do run a practice that is built on sustainable practices so uh, when you when we talk about responsible lighting from the from the point of view of a designer do you do you believe in bringing sustainability into every aspect you know from the from your planning your exec, execution point to your installation and also using lights that are you know energy efficient and reduce power bills for the user at the end yes absolutely like arjun said i mean uh, sustainable just doesn't mean the end product has to be sustainable but uh, right from the beginning uh, we're manufacturing in india uh, we're sourcing our raw materials from india we're obviously uh, currently our 90% of the light that we make are in clay so um, that is one where uh, not just that in fact clay ends up using a lot of uh, water so we even keep a check on our water intake as well um, our packaging our logistics everything uh, we're manufacturing just like 15 minutes away where like the raw materials right there so uh, for sure and then of course uh, when it comes to the light source itself um we have been uh, only using leds uh, we've never even tried working around incandescent or cfl or any other light um, leds of course like we know even the government of india is uh, has started an initiative called ujala i think the prime minister started where uh, they want to do a nationwide uh, change to led where so yeah of course we're going to every aspect uh, that uh, we're doing right now even our terrazzo uh, we don't work with concrete based terrazzo we're actually working with uh, stone based terrazzo so that also um, changes things uh, our materials we can actually give a, give a 10 year up to a 10 year warranty on our materials on our lights so yeah definitely sustainable long lasting pieces 
sorry, Tina, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so what do you mean to say that the idea of sustainability then is to uh, also to reduce the distance that you cover in bringing materials to you, in bringing labor to you? Uh, is Absolutely. that also an aspect? Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. It is. Um, uh, especially with clay, uh, we have uh, such amazing artisans in our country who we've not been exploring. Clay is such a, um, it's such a beautiful material to work with because it's right from the Indus Valley civilization from there to here, we can do so much with it. Just about anything is possible. So um, we get amazing quality clay locally available. Our artisans here are amazing. Um, everything A to Z, it just works so beautifully for us. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of other practices, a lot of other studios have started doing this as well, where they're getting to ceramic lights now. So um, yeah. Okay. And, uh... So Amal, I'm going to ask you this because you know you're, there's a lot of a lot of research and innovation that goes into your products. Uh, what are some new technologies that you know designers and homeowners can look to uh, to make their lights sustainable? So whether we're talking low energy use or like like Harshita said, LEDs and solar lights, uh, and you know even in your process to reduce wastage as much as possible so what are the new technologies that people can look forward to in making sure that their lights are sustainable so i think uh, led is something which is very commercially available and to a certain extent it reduces very minimum uh, electricity or power consumption compared to how it was about five years ago and it's, uh, it's uh, cheaply available and accessible to almost everyone. But I think the next, uh, the, the next big thing would be definitely like uh, using renewable uh, energy as a source, maybe integrating some uh, solar panels into it, uh, especially for outdoor lighting, because when you use like a, uh, a solar uh, panel integrated light source, you know, they are a wire free design. So what you can do is that you can actually place them anywhere, change the setup whenever you like to do. You don't need like an electrical point or a connection or, you know, your location is fixed. So uh, that, uh, the adaptability with that is, uh, is a lot, uh, people are very much interested into that. Uh, something new which I recently came up uh, was that I I saw that many uh, many places are integrating this new technology called it's it's, it's called as a UV uh, it's called a far UVC it has like this ultraviolet emitting chip so what these ultraviolet emitting chips uh, do is that they have these uh, very like nano wavelengths of about 200 uh, 200 uh, nanometers which don't penetrate like the human skin but they penetrate any of the pathogens around. So with COVID going on, I, I read like, you know, a lot of, lot of co companies like in their outdoor lighting or even in their lobbies or uh, public spaces, they're integrating these chips, which kind of can create a uh, COVID free environment. It, it's not like hundred uh, percent tested out, but it is something which is getting integrated. So, I mean, that would be something very, very interesting to see in coming years in India, because I'm sure that like what we've gone through like for past one, two years. I think uh, this technology is something which will blow up in like uh, very soon. I'm sure about that. So yeah, I think that that is something which I'm like looking forward to. And I think portability will be a great aspect here if people are able to you know move their lights around. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like when uh, you know, like we have so like you know we have portable speakers and why not portable lights? You know, uh, for homes also there are many people who have these lights which are this battery uh, powered and you have like your USB uh, port connected to it. You can through that even charge your phone. And you use that indoors, you start using that outdoors also. I mean, we live in a city uh, in Mumbai where we have less outdoor space. But when you go outside of maybe say Mumbai in different like uh, smaller cities, or even if you go outside India, you will, you will see that there is a lot of outdoor accessibility that people have and there they do have a lot of portable lighting, uh, which, uh, which now they are either integrating with like a battery powered LED or a solar powered LED. And, and there's also technology that enables you, for instance, if, if you have a large home with a lot of outdoor spaces yeah. and if you are, say for instance, if you're traveling for a couple of weeks, but you do forget to switch off lights, there are, you know, smart controls that enable you to do that even when you're far away, you know, through your, your pad devices or whatever. So 
I think that's a great way also to reduce your energy bills because that happens a lot. You know, you 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 may just forget to switch off something in our outdoor areas. True, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think majority of uh, upcoming houses are integrated with smart automation, which uh, which you can program it and which can even have some safety limiting factors also, where in case you forget it, they they by default uh, foolproof it that you don't end up wasting or uh, any energy. Which, which is, uh, which is quite uh, these. Uh, I mean, previously it used to be expensive, but now I think it's commercially viable for most of the people to afford and integrate uh, in in their in their houses. So yeah, that is definitely one point. Yeah, um, Arjun, you you know, like you said, you work on um, spaces entirely. It's not just the lighting fixture that's your focus. So you know, you've worked on a lot of lighting up a lot of um, large spaces as well. So when it comes to outdoor lighting, uh, you know, Harshita mentioned wall uh, lights are something that, you know, she looks at, but what are the other ways in which people can light up their outdoor spaces sustainably? Um, I think like, you know, uh, like firstly, as like a lighting designer, I hate the LED output, you know, it only emits one type of flat light. And when you want to really bring, bring warmth in spaces, like, you know, uh, like bulb lighting, uh, like the incandescent bulbs are always the favorite of lighting designers, you know, the way they generate shadows and things like that. Hence, it's very important to ensure that the LED fittings you use for the outdoor, they are sort of of a certain, like sort of a color temperature, which are accentuating your materials. You know, in terms of sustainable ways of lighting, Bettina, I mean, uh, when it comes with technology, we've already spoken about solar lighting. We've spoken about sort of uh, in terms of like technologies which uh, are going to sort of uh, help reduce our power consumption. Uh, but one thing to sort of always remember is that, you know, shadows play a very important part of any space when you're designing lighting for it. Like whether it's an outdoor terrace, balcony or, or an outdoor commercial area. So one sustainable aspect is that don't fill your outdoor area with lights. It's a very common practice where people try and light it up like a laminate shop when it's not supposed to be like lit up that well. You want to create shadows, you want to create ambiences, focus on specific areas like you know how for interior spaces if you want to light up a small sofa area rather than putting a spotlight on top you would rather put a standing lamp or a table lamp nearby. Use that same concept for outdoor lighting. Create feature zones where you want people to congregate and light up those spaces warmly through your decoratives or through a technical lighting sort of a solution over there. Create create some soft lighting in transition spaces. So in that way, you can really, through design, sort of reduce the consumption. Okay. And for people who do want to keep their lighting as sustainable as possible, uh, is there a, are there options and is there variety available in the market and the industry now? Is that is that increasing by the day? I think in terms of fittings, what we use, there are fittings all the way from 500 rupees to 20,000 rupees of fitting, maybe like, you know, higher. It just comes down to what price bracket you want to fit in. Uh, and obviously the quality and warranty of these fittings are, are sort of like very important, you know, in that sense, when you're sort of like choosing fittings. Uh, for outdoor, in general, you want to take an IP rated fitting uh, and also as designers, when we are like designing decoratives, we try and use IP rated sort of casings and fittings for our products. So, so, so uh, the IP rating sort of like determines how much uh, level of waterproofing and water resistance the fitting can take. They start, they start all the way from IP28 to swimming pool lights, which, which end up going to IP like 40 plus, you know, where they are absolute watertight casings. So it's important to understand uh, while selecting a fitting, how much uh, like water and humidity and weathering are we expecting? Uh, and is it also serving our function and purpose and then sort of make a decision? Okay. And um, in terms of materials, you know, Harshita, you've mentioned use of clay, but are there any other materials that you're seeing, you know, people have begun to experiment with that are maybe recycled or recyclable? I always say that, you know, when you want to really use recycled and sustainable materials, uh, try and uh, use outdoor sculptures as your lighting features, you know, and try and light up your space because that's where you can really create stories of sustainability, uh, things like that. Like uh, when it comes to a technical usage of power, it's all about smart designing, you know, uh, less is more. Try and get the max out of the minimal areas you like illuminate. 
you know uh, and with like materials the main thing is tina that with uh, sculptural lighting especially designed for the outdoor there's immense scope you know and uh, the lighting itself can be used as your main design feature and to sort of illuminate spaces so if so that's one very easy way to incorporate sustainability into outdoor spaces and um harshita uh, yeah. you know any materials that you've seen uh, you know people have begun to experiment with now more besides like that you mentioned clay but anything besides that um i have seen a few lights recently with upcycled marble which i found really interesting uh you know where uh, people often instead of buying the entire slab sometimes people only need a little bit of it and a really small part is remaining so there is a small company here only in bombay they're trying to work around making uh, small wall lights out of that which i think is amazing and like arjun said like uh, we've even started using uh, planter lights mirror lights uh, for outdoors uh, with just adding a, a light to an existing object uh, makes it uh, functional as well as it looks good even when it's not lit so even during the day it's it's a sculpture it's it's something it's adding to your space it's not uh, an awkward plasticky looking fixture you know so uh, it it does make a lot of difference like like arjun said and and also of course um not just um keeping a track of sustainable lighting but not not just using sustainable lights but also keeping a track of it like you know today there are apps of uh, different kinds on your phone where you can track your consumption you can see okay um this is how i can fix my pattern and see that you know how how can you fix your um daily usage pattern and see how you're consuming your uh, light so i think that also kind of helps like just adding those small features here and there yeah yeah and with um somal i'm going to come to you with this with you know so much uh, happening in the world of sustainability as well as technology um have you over the last couple of years you know changed your process in any way to to ensure that um everything from manufacturing to execution to final use is uh, balanced and there's no wastage uh to be honest on that uh, we haven't still been able to like eff- um make ourselves 100% efficient uh, to uh, about it, about it uh we have uh, previously we used to uh, use led bars we then came down to smaller led chips uh we are uh, making lights which which can be we are calling it plug and play where uh you can just plug it anywhere on the wall you can stick it and you can use it and then you can again remove it to, to take it to another space and then again plug it somewhere and use it in those ways we are doing it but in our manufacturing process uh, no yeah no we haven't been able to incorporate uh much of the technology which is out there yes uh, we try to reduce our consumption as much as possible we try to reuse uh, our material most of the products that we may make are are from metal so like you know metal is something which is uh, recyclable when we started we started out out with plastic lamps which weren't recyclable so uh, i mean our first collection was that then we slowly dis- uh, discontinued and then we went into something which was more metal oriented and the processes that we are using is also um, like the plating that we used to do before was a technology where they would dip in a chemical and uh, it would come out and we would do pu on it and that would actually create so much of like this liquid chemical as a wastage which, which would harm the environment but now we gone on to a, a better plating process where uh, we had uh, our uh, plating all of it is uh, done in a vacuum con- uh, chamber with uh, just uh, uh electro different chemicals emitted on it so there is almost like 5 to 10% of waste is happening compared to what the process we were using before so whatever uh, technologically possible within uh, locally which is available we have tried to incorporate it but i definitely see that there is a lot more that we can do which which i think we should uh, absolutely work on yeah um and harshita i want to you know ask you this um what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in running a sustainable design practice what's been the hardest you know in terms of the way you function to change packaging i think packaging is the toughest bit for us right now because we have glass ceramic terrazzo i mean like somal and arjun both agree we have to end up using sometimes um bubble wrap or some kind of corrugated plastic or something just corrugated 
cartons or paper doesn't help when it's uh, when you're shipping somewhere internationally or even within the city sometimes so i i really um, wish to change that very soon um i want to move towards more sustainable packaging uh for now what we've done is we've created really good boxes for our lights and a lot of people end up coming back to us saying hey even though i've taken the light out but i'm using that box for something else you know because it's it's nice black and hard cover rock box but when it comes to bubble wraps and uh, any kind of plastic to put in bulbs and stuff that is something that uh, we're really trying to change and um we did sample out a a paper bubble wrap company recently and uh, we ended up sending out the lights and they reached broken so we had to take a step back go back to bubble wrap so we have to just we got to do i mean there's no option right now uh, easily available at least for us but i really hope we can change that by soon yeah um, i've done you work with uh, a lot of delicate materials as well uh, what what have been the challenges that you faced in um, you know everything from manufacturing to uh sending it out in terms of packaging installation all of that to ensure that your wastage is at a minimum uh so i think one of the things that we sort of tend to do is uh like you know we end up reusing our materials so as a studio over the years sort of we've 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 set up micro uh sort of bases in calcutta delhi bangalore hyderabad uh hopefully in ahmedabad soon so when most of our projects or our material goes to these sort of cities our people are the ones unloading it and unpacking and installing our pieces at the projects so we end up re like you know just recycling most of our cartons most of our bubble wrap most of our wastage and sometimes even when we do exhibitions you know we sort of carry the same crates the same sort of packing material uh one sort of innovation the studio has been trying to sort of work on is we're collaborating with a startup in bangalore where they've been sort of experimenting with mycelium packaging where it's sort of like these fibrous mushrooms which grow and create a sustainable sort of tool as a replacement for foam and bubble wrap you know so dell computers has been doing it for a very long time so we've been trying to work with them to see if we can sort of grow our own sort of mushroom packaging and sort of use that for the smaller products first uh the safest and the easiest way to send larger pieces i don't think like you know there's going to be a replacement to a wooden crate and lot of foam at any time soon especially when you are transporting a lot of glass uh so uh and i think the sustainability in this sort of process is producing it only once once it breaks you start the whole manufacturing process sort of all over again to sort of produce the piece again and replace it so it's just important to try and recycle your like material or make sure the end user the client has maybe a recycling program you know so it's very easy to add a note where you can sort of just send that hey we are sending a product to you in raipur the closest recycling center for you is this area over here it, it would be great if you can like drop off the like, waste material there you know so i'm sure a very sort of a conscientious sort of a customer would do that it's great that you brought this up because i want to understand this as well are uh, the people who the end users are they open and understanding this concept of um, uh, you know lowering energy use using materials that come from the ground is there an an acceptance or a growing understanding of the, these concepts i think it's sort of firstly important to understand what type of like development is happening in the country like a lot of it is not very sustainable you know like even like you know like majority of our projects go into like luxury or semi luxury homes when it comes with decorative lighting or the like or the category we sort of uh, go and supply at and in those cases lot of those projects sustainability with the scale of construction itself it's something that can be questioned in that uh, like you know in that sort of context but uh, from a sustainability form of construction lot of architects and designers are exploring materials where the building itself is sustainable there's a lot of longevity of the material being used for the hardware for the electricals there's a lot of reusability of the material you know simple thing like when you use like you know like metals like stainless steel brass copper even when that fitting is discarded say 10 15 20 50 years later it's still a fully recyclable sort of a material you know uh, sort of barring the plastic being used in the led or something over there so in that sense i think sustainability is there uh, like within the industry uh, trying to sort of fine tune it in terms of limited usage would be one of the ways where people can can maybe uh, try and put some control 
and not over design or over build. As a lighting studio, Somil, I'm going to uh, come to you with this. As a lighting studio, um, how do you think uh, you know more and more studios can become um, aware of sustainable practices that are available to them to use? Because there's a lot of time because sustainable is still such a growing concept. Uh, you know, people are still learning about it. Like like you and Harshita mentioned, there are challenges that everybody is facing. So if you do want to take that step up and become a sustainable practice. How can lighting studios, you know, become a little more aware of, of doing that? I think it just doesn't apply to lighting studios. It can apply to like any studio designing furniture, doing interiors or architecture. And I don't think so. It's something that we can, we can do in a short period of time, but it has to be a slow process where you actually change people's mindset. And once once we reach that level, then I'm sure like we all are creative enough to find better ways, better solutions uh, to go about it. Like, uh, I think that, yes, we are complaining that, you know, we still have to use this bubble wrap packaging or stuff like that. But I think when, when we, if, because we are creative people and it just doesn't like apply to lighting, we, we are creative in like whatever we do with, you know? So I, I think that once like, you know, the, uh, the momentum builds up to it, like, uh, and there is more awareness then there will come to a point where uh, once you make a firm decision that this is not something that you want to continue with, then I feel like uh, definitely we'll find better ways to go about, about it. So I think it's, it's a process and um, maybe like in coming few years, uh, we'll face lesser challenges or maybe bigger challenges also. You know, maybe like, maybe there'll be something which we don't, we don't look at something which is like non-sustainable right now, but like five years down the line, we think that, oh, this is not at all sustainable, you know? So that realization will come with time, uh, but it, as I said, it's a process and it's just, um, the more, more people are aware about it, the more it spreads, the faster it will be. Mm -hmm. um, and Harshita, do you have a similar take? Uh, you know, do you believe that when, if you're creating something sustainable, that that concept has to be imbibed in who you are and how you function as well? I think, um, it's the other way around because we are uh, trained, taught designers, architects. That's how we end up making products that are sustainable. And like sustainable, the word is just thrown around very easily these days. And um, so it's not just, um, it's everything. It's right from day zero to the time when it's delivered to the client to the, how long the product is going to last. It's, it's everything included. So uh, we try to keep a check on as many things as we can. Uh, considering that we, I mean, at least I am a very small studio right now. So uh, for whatever I can control, I try. Um, but yeah, we definitely need more um, companies coming up with, you know, innovative packing, pack, packaging solutions like Arjun suggested, or, um, you know, just better, more, um, better sustainable ways to everything. We, we can socially come up with better lights, better light sources, better packaging better, logistic ways, everything. So um, we're just trying to be as efficient as we can as of now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I do agree because, uh, you know, sustainability as a, as a word and a concept is used a little too freely. And I don't, maybe not everybody really understands the core concept and, and people are still learning and catching up, which is why my question was to Arjun, you know, that are people developing and understanding um, of the concept. So do you, Harshita, do you find that, that people are being more accepting of sustainable practices? No, yeah, definitely. They, they do make a conscious effort to ask us questions also about how our products are made. And sometimes like if I, I know the person is just living around, they'll tell me that just give it to me in the hand, in my hand, the lamp, don't give me a box and everything. So people are definitely uh, conscious, not just about lights, but the way they dressed, the, the bags that they're carrying, everything. So um, it's, you can see a, a, a difference, definitely, yeah. Okay. Um, um, Arjun, I, I want to ask you this question. How can uh, designers now, uh, you know, ensure that there is more, there is balance, there's um, recyclability, there's uh, the aesthetic value, there's functionality. How can designers ensure that that balance is maintained when it comes to outdoor lighting? Like through your experience, what have you noticed are some of the biggest factors that help in bringing that balance about? 
I think uh, with outdoor lighting to bring that balance in, it's very sort of important to uh, really complement the outdoor design. You know, say for example, if you're doing a very botanical sort of a theme, how you incorporate plants with your lighting and how you sort of illuminate those elements, that is something which is extremely important. So how your lighting plays a complementary role and when you want to design some feature installations, how they sort of stand out in the landscape. So I think that's something uh, which is very important to bring balance into an outdoor space. Uh, like I said, you don't need to really overdo your outdoor lighting, try and create some shadows, try and create some dark spaces, well-lit spaces, dimly lit spaces. So if you can sort of create that balance uh, between the three, uh, you could create a very interesting sort of an outdoor, like a lighting design, you know. And how can designers or lighting studios become more aware of or um, of being as sustainable as possible? What's the best way to do that? We can't hear you. Uh, huh. Yeah, is it clear now? Yeah. I think we can learn like, you know, really from our past of how we lit outdoor spaces pre-LED and pre-sort of electrification, you know. Uh, like, you know, if you see that uh, how people used to use lanterns, how they used to use uh, fire torches to sort of light those, uh, to illuminate outdoor spaces, they used to sort of illuminate like really specific areas for like, like you know, for like specific purposes and sort of studying uh, those lighting techniques would be a great place to sort of start and take inspiration from, you know, and a lot of the outdoor materials which were being used back then in terms of natural stones were sort of lit really well with limited sources of lighting. So it could be a great sort of research to sort of start from there and then sort of uh, like, you know, try and try and make outdoor lighting as part of your landscape design. You know, try to make it very subtle, try to have like well-lit areas and just create a design scheme with a certain uh, like, you know, like respect for shadows in outdoor. You don't need to light it up like a very evenly lit space. Okay, that's great advice. Um, I think that, that wraps up our chat for today. That's everything we wanted to speak about. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for your time and you know for great insights. There's a lot that I've learned today as well. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope we can, we can take this non-virtual very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can learn like, you know, really from our past of how we lit outdoor spaces pre-LED and pre-sort of electrification, you know, uh, like, you know, if you see that uh, how people used to use lanterns, how they used to use uh, fire torches to sort of light those, uh, to illuminate outdoor spaces, they used to sort of illuminate like really specific areas for like, like you know, for like specific purposes and sort of studying uh, those lighting techniques would be a great place to sort of start and take inspiration from you know, and a lot of the outdoor materials which were being used back then in terms of natural stones were sort of lit really well with limited sources of lighting. So it could be a great sort of research to sort of start from there and then sort of uh, like, you know, try and try and make outdoor lighting as part of your landscape design, you know, try to make it very subtle, try to have like well-lit areas and just create a design scheme with a certain uh, like, you know, like respect for shadows in outdoor. You don't need to light it up like a very evenly lit space. Right. Okay. Okay, that's great advice. Um, I think that, that wraps up our chat for today. That's everything we wanted to speak about. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for your time and, you know, for great insights. There's a lot that I've learned today as well. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope we can, we can take this non-virtual very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.